So I'd now like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, we are so gracious and so grateful that Karen Davis is joining us. She is the president and founder of United Poultry Concerns, a nonprofit that addresses the treatment of domestic fowl in food production, science, education, and entertainment. Uh, she is the author of several books, including Prison Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, An Insider's Look at the Modern Poultry Industry, and More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality. She maintains a, sa a sanctuary for chickens and other birds uh, on the eastern shore of Virginia, and she's going to be speaking to us today on urban chicken keeping problems and recommendations. Please welcome Karen Davis. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Good. Well, I'll tell you, it is great to be here today and to see all of you. As Hope said, uh, last summer we started planning this conference and uh, it's just great to see that it's come together this way and that everything did come together. And um, so here we go. I'm the first speaker. And because the uh, local war movement, the uh, urban chicken, the urban animal keeping movement has really focused more on chickens than any other animal. And because chickens are my, my, my business as, and my passion, uh, I'm going to talk about chickens. Uh, chickens I know from our sanctuary in Machapongo, Virginia. I started keeping rescue chickens in 1987. And there hasn't been a day gone by in my entire, what, 30, almost 25 years now or more that I have not spent with chickens, except when I'm here. And even here, I, you know, if I'm on a speaking engagement, I'm still talking chickens and I'm still showing chickens. So I want to tell you a little bit about how I got started, why I decided to focus on chickens as my uh, vocation and what I have learned about them because, and then I'm gonna talk uh, specifically about the, uh, the things that people need to know if they decide they want to keep uh, backyard chickens. Uh, we hope for, as companions and that's what we promote. Uh, first of all, I did not grow up around chickens. I did grow up in a small town in Altoona, Pennsylvania, but we did not keep chickens and really when I was growing up in the early 1950s, uh, old-fashioned uh, uh, chicken and turkey and, and goose and duck keeping was just at that very time in the mid-20th century being overtaken by what we now know as the uh, industrial uh, factory farm poultry and egg industry. That was all happening during World War II and then it really, the poultry industry, which, which is the model for all factory farming of animals all other animals and throughout the world, actually began officially in uh, a town called Georgetown, Delaware, which is called the broiler capital of the world, which is one of the saddest things that ever happened to a chicken or any other living being on this planet. And we are actually located in that area called the Delmarva Peninsula, which is, uh, uh, comprises all of Delaware, by the way, Sussex County, Delaware, uh, raises and slaughters more chickens than any other county in the United States for meat. Uh, the eastern shore of Maryland and the eastern shore of Virginia, which is where we're located, so that we can have our sanctuary, so we can have our 18 crowing roosters, and so that we have the zoning and what, not, what we need in order to have our sanctuary as well as run our national organization. It was really in the mid-1980s that I got to know my first chicken named Viva. And her story is right on our homepage, on our website, and her story is also right outside on our United Poultry Concerns table, which I urge you to pick up and read about her, because she really, getting to know Viva, who was from the broiler, that is the meat chicken industry, um, she, and she herself was very crippled and had been left behind when all the other chickens were gathered up for slaughter by our, our landlady and her helper back in the mid-1980s. And it was my bringing her into our home and getting to know her that just completely uh, caused me to have a feeling for chickens that has just grown stronger every year. She was so warm and expressive and communicative and sociable and sweet. And when I compared her and how she was with me, how loving she was, with the sort of standard stereotypes that many people have about chickens, 
as a result primarily of the um, industrial chicken industry, which has done everything possible through television advertising and in a thousand other ways to completely dissociate people from who these birds really are, to represent them in a manner that is um, degrading and uh, 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 makes these birds look stupid and actually uh, disappears the birds altogether into just a piece of meat. And that is one of the things that we and these birds are faced with now, that they have disappeared from uh, the natural world, from the landscape, and from the consciousness of people who I can tell you from the vast amount of historical reading I have done, have throughout history have admired chickens, have admired roosters as symbols of virility, and in the Victorian era, the hen and the rooster were considered to be the paragons of domesticity. Uh, the hen was a, a, a thrifty, uh, a caring a bird who uh, uh, made many, uh, shamed many women, as one writer wrote, you know, that, that she's so attentive to her chicks and she so minds her responsibilities. And the rooster, of course, gets up every morning and runs around to find food for his family. The rooster stands back and lets his whole family eat before he eats. There are all these marvelous things about chickens that have been celebrated through centuries that got lost in the 20th century, that were deliberately obscured from our consciousness and our public knowledge. So one of the positive things about this renewed interest in uh, keeping chickens is that for the first time, many people are discovering, hey, you know, chickens are, are, are interesting. They do have personalities. You know, I got chickens just because I wanted some eggs, but uh, here I've discovered that I've, I've fallen in love with Isabel and, uh, and, and Suzanne, and uh, they like to follow me around the yard, and this is like a revelation to people. So uh, that's a positive side of things. Um, and I'll get into some of the other aspects in a moment. Um, as I said, I've been keeping chickens since 1987, and um, at our sanctuary, I've had a, a great opportunity on a daily basis to actually observe their behavior um, and to interact with them and, and just have an int intimate relationship with them as far as that's possible, um, given that, uh, you know, we, we, we come together and they also have their own worlds, their own dramas, their own societies, and I wouldn't even presume to understand everything about chickens or everything about you or you. Uh, but uh, I have been very attentive to them and their lives and their interests. And so I do feel that I have reached a place where I can proudly say that I think I can speak somewhat on behalf of chickens and be a voice for them. Never think that animals are voiceless. They do have voices. They have every type of voice. Chickens are one of the most vocal creatures on the planet. They have many different voices for many different emotions. Uh, things, pursuits that they're carrying out, their social life, and so on. So they're not voiceless. They have voices. We need to listen to their voices. We are their capital V voice, I would say, because we politicize their, them and their situation. So only in that sense would I dare to say that I'm their voice, because I'm trying to be a voice for them now to you to expound their lives, as Alice Walker so beautifully said in an essay she wrote several years ago called, Why Did the Balinese Chicken Cross the Road? So I have taken on that, um, that, that, that charge to exp try as best I can to expound the life of chickens. Now, one of the things that has concerned me very much in looking at many websites um, that are run by people who have started keeping backyard chickens, usually for eggs, and increasingly for slaughter, is that they don't know much about chickens. They're learning, there's a, like a circle, an in, what I guess I'd call an inbred circle of people who talk back and forth to each other. And, and, and it isn't just that only that the knowledge of chickens and who they are, where they derive from, what their interests are, what their needs are, what their personalities are, it's not only that lack of just basic factual knowledge, but there's also an attitude which is just as distressing. And which that, an attitude which will prevent people who think that way 
to ever have a true relationship with a chicken because if you come to a creature with an attitude of kind of a supercilious superiority, uh, you're not going to have, you're not going to bring out in them, you're not going to elicit in them all that they can show. They're going to, chickens are very, very attuned to the emotional resonance around them. They pick up on it all. So that's part of their genetic nature. Another thing is, chickens, they have better eyesight than we do and better hearing. They see the full spectrum of colors from ultraviolet to infrared. Chickens, roosters, start crowing in what for us is still the dark, the dark, but it's not dark for them because chickens see infrared light. So that when it's still dark for us in the early morning, they're already seeing light. And that's why roosters start crowing in the dark, because it's not dark for them. They say, see light. Chickens come from the tropical forests of Southeast Asia, as far as every, you know, far back as people can go, the jungle fowl, and the rugged foothills of the Himalayan mountains. And chickens' wild relatives live and thrive in those very parts of the world to this very day, raising their families, roosting in trees at night, breaking up into small groups, foraging, that is scratching and digging for food in the soil. Chickens love to sunbathe. In fact, when I started keeping chickens, um, and I was learning, I had to learn from scratch about who they are and what their interests are and what their behaviors mean and all of that. I remember that when people would visit our sanctuary and they'd see a hen like she's flopped on the ground with her legs spread out and her wings fanned out. And they'd say, what's wrong with her? Is she dead? And I said, no, she's taking a sun bath. Um, without getting into all of the complexities, um, chickens love sunlight. They love and they need natural sunlight. They need natural sunlight as to, to be able to connect with their preen oil and their preening of their feathers and the ingestion of the preen oil in uh, relation to the sunlight uh, getting through their plumage is how they get a, a, an essential nutrient, which for them is vitamin D3. And it's like everything that we really, really need in order to be healthy and to thrive as biological beings usually are things that give us great pleasure, whether it's sex, food, or whatever. You know, we, all, we just happen to like to do those things that we need to do in order to, to live and thrive and be healthy. So for chickens, uh, the sun is bliss. Uh, they love, they will follow in the winter when the days are short and the sunlight, the days of the hours of sunlight are short, the chickens will follow the sunlight all around the yard. And they will do everything they can to gather up that sunlight because they have that instinctual knowledge that they need that and they enjoy that. Another thing chickens do, which is so important to know about, is they dust bathe. Now, many people, you know, have this terrible, totally false idea that chickens are somehow dirty or smelly. Well, if any animal is dirty and smelly, there's only one real reason for that. And that is, if they, they, they're domesticated, like a, number one, and they're being kept by people who are, who are responsible for the dirt and the filth and, what, and the smells that they exude. No animals in nature smell. They only smell when they are captives of us. And moreover, when they are captives of people who do not keep them clean. Remember that if they are enclosed, instead of wandering around widely in an open range on a forest floor as they evolve to do, their droppings are going to build up the same as if somebody closed the door on us right here and now, and we, had, we were going to be here urinating and, and excreting. So then we get blamed because after a day or so, the place starts to smell of our body odor and our excretions. Well, you know, we need to extrapolate that kind of a situation to the way we often talk in a very smart alecky way about other animals who have the misfortune to be locked up and unable to keep themselves clean. So I want to emphasize here that chickens by nature keep themselves very clean. Anybody who has chickens like we do, I mean, you smell their feathers, they, they're soft and, and luxurious and they, they smell really fresh and good. And I get back to dust bathing because that is a primary way that chickens have of uh, performing bodily hygiene. Um, what they do is, and it's also a social activity, just like dust bathing or sunbathing, because chickens are innately social, sociable birds. 
So you know, what will often happen is you'll see one hen, you know, she'll start making a dust bowl. And they really do make deep bowls sometimes, an earth bowl, if you want to put it that way. And then another hen will see her, and she'll come over and join her. And they start using their claws and their beaks, and they rub their body around, and they make this, this bowl deeper and deeper. And then other hens will usually join them, and then often the rooster will saunter over, and he'll sit, sit down in the midst of them. And maybe for 20 minutes or more, they are clawing at the dirt with their, and, and, and digging with their beak, and they're getting all those earth particles into their feathers and onto their skin as a way to loosen built up oils, any type of debris. And it's a, it, it, even, it, it is even a major way of them maintaining good feather structure, good plumage. So dust bathing is essential to chickens, not only to their bodily hygiene, but to their sense of being clean. Chickens. I've said to people, you know, on a day when it's like raining and it's dreary out, you know, I can become dispirited. But one of the joys of keeping chickens is no weather bothers them. They like it all. They're happy when it's cold, when it's raining, when it's snowing. They run out in the snow. Of course, they love the sunlight. But they're, all, they're happy, you know, and they cheer me up. I don't, want, I don't dare act miserable when I see how happy and cheerful and animated they are in any kind of weather. But where chickens become visibly and in all obvious ways dispirited is when they're not being treated well. Then they actually droop toward the earth. Their heads, their heads are droopy, their tails are down, their eyes look sunken. It's really noticeable. They really respond to being ill-treated, dirty, mistreated, neglected. They really know. Their whole being knows that this is a miserable situation in which they find themselves. So when I read on some of these uh, internet discussions, um, things about how, oh, you know, you keep chickens, it's really easy, you never, you know, you only have to clean them out once a year or something like that. Well, first of all, that sounds just like the poultry industry. They only clean out the huge 500 foot long uh, uh, chicken houses where they keep 30 to 50,000 birds all stuck together at one time. They only clean them out every couple of years, two, three years. So these places are real, you know, they're real, uh, you know, they're, they are true cesspools, um, really. Um, but so when we hear the, like the so-called alternative people talking the same way, basically saying you don't need to clean out their houses or anything, well, if you're going to keep chickens, yes, you do. I mean, I have two sanctuary helpers, and then there's me. We have the, the best tool in the world is a spackling knife, a nice wide spackling knife. You go under where they roost, because under there, they're going to be droppings for the night. And again, keep in mind that chickens are treed well. You know, they sleep in trees by nature. That would, they'd be going up into the trees like any other bird. They would normally, a normal chicken would have very tiny droppings. The droppings um, have the nitrogen and things that help to make plants grow. It's only when those droppings accumulate and accumulate and, the, the, and as the bacteria are breaking down the uric acid in the droppings, that that uric acid turns into an ammonia product. And then you're walking into a place where your eyes are burning and your lungs are burning, and it's a toxic waste environment, literally. So all chickens, and turkeys, pigs who are being raised industrially live in those kinds of environments. Their eyes are burning. They go blind with what's called keratoconjunctivitis, in many cases, from the burning of their eyes. But when you read so-called alternative website people talking about how they don't have to clean up their, the, the house, their, chick, their coop, their chickens are in, or they say, um, uh, we keep the droppings because they'll help to warm up the house, and then we don't have to heat the house. You see, there you're looking at you're looking at attitudes and, 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 and really, an, you know, just a basic ignorance that, that needs to be dispelled. You know, if you don't want to do the work, don't keep an animal. If you don't want to care for them properly, make sure they, they're kept clean. I mean, if they're captive, there's only so much they can do to keep themselves clean. They can only go as far as the walls. And uh, so, you know, so you have to give them that sense that they're, that they're clean and that they're cared for. Chickens really, really pick up on that. And of course, I'm speaking about chickens here, but that's true of whether we're talking about dogs or cats or children or whoever we're talking about. Everybody wants to feel cared for. They don't want to feel neglected. And, like, and nobody feels good when they're dirty. And I can tell you, chickens become so dispirited. I've been to many, many places, some of these so-called 
I don't know, roadside zoos and children's zoos and all kinds of places I visited over the years. And there they are, the chickens have lice and mites and they feel miserable and they're neglected and they, their whole spirit is just sunken, you know? You, you look at the roosters and they're just looking at you and it's just, it's so sad and it's so wrong. So I thought my, I thought this was playing here. Where's, where are the images? Oh, did, oh, did you just now turn it off? Oh. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, um, I think what I'm going to do right now, and then what I'd like to do is show this video, and then I'd like to go back to the slideshow, because I do really want to be backed up here by my, by my, by subjects. So I'm going to show you a very short video. We hear a lot in, um, amongst, you know, these people who are in keeping backyard chickens, or some so-called small farm people that, you know, that, you know, these chickens are treated humanely and they're slaughtered humanely. I, I want to dispel from anybody's uh, uh, thoughts uh, any idea that, um, that throat cutting is a humane and quick death. The, the, the whole throat area is full of nociceptors known as, or, you know, pain, pain receptors. Uh, the parts of the body, like around the throat and so on and other parts of the skin, not only are full of pain receptors, they're also full of like thermoreceptors, which register heat and cold and varying temperatures and impact receptors. So there, this is a very, very, very sensitive area in chickens, no less than in human beings and turkeys, okay? So when you hear somebody say, well, as long as you have a sharp knife and you go like that, you know, they don't feel it. Well, we need to get away from the idea that animals don't feel pain when we cut them with a knife. Uh, they certainly do, and their behavior shows it. Now, one of the things that, that uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, uh, Polyface Farm in Virginia, Joel Salatin, who's represented in Food, Inc., and who Michael Pollan is treated like he's some kind of a god. I can tell you, he's more of a devil, all right? There's nothing romantic about, Mike, about, about Joel Salatin and, 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 and Polyface. And I don't have a lot of time to get into that, but I'll just tell you one thing about Joel, whom I know, whom I've met, talked to. He believes that only human beings have souls. He has stated that in writing. He has, Michael Pollan has, has, has quoted him on that and seemingly okay, that here's a man who believes that other animals don't have souls, only human beings have souls. Well, again, um, without getting into a whole religious thing, I would just say that, that I think to me, to me, this is a very, very narcissistic and solipsistic point of view. This is a very, and, it, and without any foundation whatsoever, especially since uh, given all that we know about the, 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 the continuity of, of life. Uh, humans, uh, 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 other mammals, uh, the fish in the sea, the, the, the birds of the air, the birds who run around on the ground, whatever. So to say that, well, we, we're the only ones who have souls and the rest of animals don't have a soul, uh, again, that's su such an arrogant and such a, 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 a mean uh, and, and unfounded attitude. But that's just one thing that characterizes Joel Sal Salatin. And so to make him a paragon of, like, humane concern for animals, um, well, I, I just say that, you know, people need to really, you know, develop a, 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 an attitude of, like, a critical, critical thinking and uh, scrutinizing of what, what people actually say and the attitudes they actually show. And again, I, I'm going to always stress this, attitude, attitude, attitude. There, there have been a number of women I, I've noticed on the Internet who are starting to keep chickens, and they seem, in some cases, to actually enjoy the power of of slaughtering them on the internet and and uh, 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 treating it like it's, I don't know, it's like a sort of mastery thing or something, you know? It's, uh, well, anyway, we're gonna look now, if it's ready, um, at a, a small farm where the chickens that, who are being bred, raised for meat, who, by the way, these chickens that you're gonna see, these white chickens, even though they're on a so-called small alternative farm, they are the exact type of white so-called broiler chickens who have been bred specifically for the industrial chicken industry. They were most likely, as in the case of Joel Salatin, purchased from huge industrial factory farm hatcheries and flown in dark boxes at the cheapest possible rate 
And Joel Salatin and these so-called small chicken keepers are among the, the most avid lobbyers to be allowed to purchase their chickens not only from these big industrial hatcheries like Murray McMurray in Iowa, but to have them travel at the cheapest rate whereby the birds have no temperature control, they're bashed around and banged around like canned goods, where, can you imagine being a newborn bird, a baby, being thrown into a dark box and then maybe you're sitting on loading docks for a long time before the plane even gets going, you're hearing noises, you're hungry, they'll say, oh, well, they don't need to eat for 72 hours. That isn't true. Most chicks who are raised and hatched and raised by the mother hen are the, all the viable chicks, the ones who are actually going to break out of the egg and be be able to get up and go, um, are hatched within 24 hours, or at most 48 hours. So here these birds are, many of them arrive at their final destination dehydrated. Once the internal body organs of an animal are truly dehydrated, even if they live a few more days, they do not, they die. So dehydration is a huge problem in the case of these birds being flown that way. Um, uh, starvation and fear, just fear, fear, because I think when you put any animal in a situation where they have absolutely no control over their life, where all their natural instincts to protect themselves, all their, their inborn genetic expectation of a mother, of, 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 of feathers, all of that is taken away from them. And before we show this, I'll just say one more thing. Um, one of the things that these big hatcheries do, because see, they have such a, super, a superfluity of, on one, of roosters, because even around the country where these um, uh, munis municipalities are beginning to rezone to allow people to keep chickens, a few, like two or four or six chickens, in almost every case, they zone only for hens and you can't have roosters. Well, for every hen who's born, at least one rooster is born. Well, the question is, where is he? Where does he go? Well, he goes into the trash, whether it's so-called the hatcheries that supply the, 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 all, you know, the Joel Salatin type of polyface farms or whatever they may be. That's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is that, as we've learned in our research, is that they, since they have all these roosters they don't have any use for, um, they will use them as what they call packers, where they actually, instead of packing material for the, let's say somebody orders six baby hens, they just throw a few roosters in there. As, and as packing material, which they call packers. So then let's say the person who ordered six baby, you know, female chicks opens the box, right? And in nor most cases, the person, the recipient, doesn't even know a baby hen from a baby rooster anyway. They don't know even how to sex them properly. Then even looking at their faces, they can't tell who's who. So then, lo and behold, they discover, oh, three of these birds are roosters. And the zoning doesn't allow me to keep roosters. And I can only keep hens. So then our sanctuary and all the sanctuaries around the country in California, Virginia, Maryland, and everywhere get calls. We have two roosters. Could you think we could find, you could find a home for them? We have three roosters. We didn't order them. Do you think you could find a home for them? So one of the saddest fallouts of the backyard chicken keeping um, uh, phenomenon is the plethora of unwanted roosters who are resulting from it. So I'm going to show you now just a small portion of, a, of a, this uh, farm in Texas where, okay, you'll see for yourself. I think I'll just shut up and let you watch. So ready to go. Huh? Uh, well, at this point, whatever we can get going is what we need. So the audio isn't working? No, but it's not set up for it.
So I want to tell you just a few things about what you just looked at. First of all, most of these backyard chicken keeping people and these small farms like that one, like Polyface and a bunch of others that are springing up, um, they use killing cones, which you saw there. Okay, now what the killing cone does is it prevents the bird from thrashing, which is a profoundly cruel thing to do. Because try to imagine yourself, your throat is cut, and thrashing at least would be less torturous than being immobilized so that you can't move. So the only, the only beings who are spared suffering in this case are the observers. Although you can see that there's great suffering taking place in those birds, even in the killing cones. So putting a, putting a bird in a killing cone is extremely cruel. It's, a, it's been done since, for centuries, but it's extremely cruel, okay? Killing animals in front of each other is extremely cruel. They're looking at each other, being treated like that. Just as in factory farming, because this is just an extension of factory farming, and moreover, it's the, it's the behavior and attitude that factory farming grew out of. People who think that family farming used to be nice, and then the problems just developed in the mid-20th century when so-called factory farming came into being, just don't know the history of animal farming. You can go back centuries and centuries to ancient Greece, and even the great poet uh, Shelley wrote about the horrible treatment of animals who are being raised for food. How many people know that one of the standard practices in England, and probably it still goes on in, in rural areas, is to nail uh, uh, ducks and geese off and nail their feet to the floor? Because see, it's an old ancient idea that if you're feeding an animal to become meat, you don't want them to move. Because when they move, they waste feed. So you want, and secondly, if they move, their, their muscle's gonna get tough and sinewy, and um, also, they're not gonna just become a big pile of meat quickly enough. So when we talk about factory farming, what we're talking about is enlarging the scale, the size, the gargantuan astronomical size of, oper of, of poultry and egg operations, and by extension, I mean other farmed animal operations. But because, you know, the majority of people now are eating chickens, and it takes many chickens to create a bucket of wings, or people buy, you know, maybe one side of a piece of one cow, but they buy three uh, chicken breasts. There's three dead chickens in a package of chicken breasts. So what I'm trying to get across is that factory farming, it isn't to hear these, some of these slogans about how, well, we need to go back to old-fashioned farming or factory farming is bad and uh, we need to go back or we need to, you know, revive these. That's not how it really, that's factory farming derived from attitudes and behaviors that have been animal farming attitudes and behaviors since time immemorial. And what was it that a, an observer, a sensitive observer, said in the 16th century about the, the life and death of animals in, in merry old England? He said, they live in pain, they sleep in pain, they die in pain. That was in the 16th century. So we want to, you know, we want to, we want to be clear about some of these things. Um, many of the birds, as you saw there, they're not even dead when they're put in the skull tank. Now, that's a standard operating procedure in the, the poultry industry. Um, millions and millions of birds are scalded alive, conscious and breathing. But we see that even on this so-called humane alternative farm, the same kind of thing is being done. I'll tell you something else. In the 1930s, the use of electricity was developed. And try to, again, picture in your mind the development of applying electrical currents to a live, sensitive body. Think of the experimentation, which goes on all over the world, even today. Not for, to, to create certain meat characteristics in the flesh. Uh, the word, when you hear about electrical stunning of poultry, please understand that the word stunning is a 100% false statement, okay? They are not stunned at all. The industry has no intention of stunning them. Traditionally, farmers have often, okay, they want to immobilize the birds, okay, when they're hanging upside down. And think about how unnatural it is for a chicken to hang, or a turkey to hang upside down. There's nothing in nature where they hang upside down. And of course, the blood is rushing to their heads, right? 
So that helps to keep you conscious even longer. But um, up, you know, a standard farming practice, old-fashioned farming practice, to immobilize the birds so they wouldn't be thrashing around um, on the slaughter line, in addition to the killing cone, would be to take a knife and there's a groove that goes like this in the chicken and the turkey's uh, roof of the mouth. So they take a knife and they take that knife and they go up into the brain of the bird and they go like that, scramble that part of the brain to immobilize the bird. The other big reason in order to keep the bird, not, is not in addition to keeping the bird immobilized, on the slaughter line or on this, you know, in your backyard or wherever it's being done, is to uh, um, facilitate the removal of their feathers after they're dead. So the feathers will pop out more easily after um, the, uh, the muscles of the feather follicles have been paralyzed. Now, it is a fact that, for example, in the, the, all of the poultry industry uh, slaughter plants, that these birds are being immobilized, uh, fully conscious, with powerfully painful electrical volts in milliampers. Now, the poultry industry deliberately keeps the birds alive during this process, which again they lyingly call stunning. It has nothing to do with stunning. All the actually all the all of these different things that they do to them uh, actually cause more agony: the electric shocks, the killing cones, the knife up through the roof of the mouth into the brain. Okay, it paralyzes the birds, that's all it does. For the convenience of the farmer, for the convenience of the processor, the, the slaughterer, that's what it does. So I can tell you that when you read through the history of uh, poultry keeping, and you compare that with the life of these birds in their natural habitats, chickens are among the most cheerful beings on the planet. They are so family oriented. Roosters. You know, you hear, oh, roosters are fighters. No, they're not. They're family, family guys. What, rooster, what a rooster wants more than anything in the world is to have at least one hen, or 10, or 20, or 1,000, to, to watch over, to be with, to make a nest with. Because see, in nature, the rooster accompanies the hen, and the head hen, and together they choose the nest together. It might be in a hollow log or whatever it is where the hen is going to sit on her eggs. See, the rooster is very, very involved in the family life. Roosters love to carry their chicks on their backs. Uh, they're very, and roosters, of course, are famous for, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, um, they run around, they like to find food for the hens and the chicks, and then they will stand back, as someone has said, like, a, like the host at a banquet, and, and let their hens and their chicks eat first. They have all these etiquettes, all these uh, uh, rituals of social life. And of course, in these farming situations, most of that is, uh, I'm sorry, what is the amount of time? I have 10 more minutes? Okay, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna give it, you a chance to ask me some questions. But you know, these, these rituals, even like with the rhythms of the day, see, like as I mentioned, uh, chickens, they see infrared light, they see light about an hour before we do. So they're up in, in their, let's say, in their, in their tropical forest environment. They're coming down out of the trees, and they're running around on the forest floor, and they're scratching, digging, looking for food, and the, the hens are teaching their young, and the roosters are sort of like finding food and calling them, and, you know, the roosters uh, go, choo, choo, and the hens, we see this in our own yard all the time, you know, and the hens come running. And they're, they're full of, they're just full of joy, you know, they're just happy about things. And um, so their day is like, you know, they get up, they love to forage in the morning, and um, then in the, the midday, they sunbathe and dust bathe. They eat almost nothing during, chickens eat almost nothing during those hours of the day from like, you know, um, noon through to around four o'clock. They they sunbathe and they dust bathe and they sit on the branches and they just sort of, uh, you know, they're just calm and contented. And then as the day wanes and it gets closer to evening, dusk, then they like to spread out again. In fact, I like to use this image because it's so accurate. And when you talk about how, you know, the movement of chickens, it's sort of like they, they spread out in the morning to forage. Then they, it, like in a centrifugal manner, and then the centrip 
pedal manner, brings them back in together like this, where they do their sunbathing and their dust bathing, and then they spread out again in a centrifugal ma manner, foraging for food, pecking around, getting, getting all those micronutrients that chickens have an unerring ability to find on their own in the soil. See, it isn't just something they're walking on. The soil is full of interest for them. It's full of nutrients. It's full of all kinds of things for them. Okay. Anyway, and then they come back together in the evening, and of course in nature they would go into the trees, and they'd all be together. One of the most touching things, we don't, of course, we don't allow any chickens to breed at reproduce at Art Sanctuary. Well, we two did, two did. But anyway, and, and <laughs> it, it was one of those things, but tw on two different occasions. But um, in both cases, I mean, it was just a joy and a privilege to watch the mother hen and, and her baby and how really, I mean, the roosters just let the mother hen and her and her chick alone completely, like during those early, those five months. They just went around on their own. The other chickens were there, including the roosters, and they just kind of lived in their own enchanted circle, you know. But what I started to get at is when I first started keeping chickens, um, you know, 20 some years ago, uh, there were some chicks who had been uh, 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 born in, a, in a, a classroom chick hatching project, which we also totally oppose. Um, and so somebody called me about bringing them from Michigan to our sanctuary. They were all babies. In fact, you'll see their picture. I just passed this around, and uh, you can come to our table also out there, and you can see uh, Glynis and Charity and um, um, Clarence. Those, this is three of those five chickens. There was also Violetta and, uh, and one other one. Um, anyway, so, um, so what they do is, is, I mean, chickens until like the first three months or so, you know, they're always going under their mother's wings for... Uh, comfort and uh, warmth when they're babies and then at night they go under their mother's wings. So what they would all do is they'd all huddle together, you know, because they didn't have a mother. So at night they'd all huddle together. Their heads would all be in, they'd all be trying to get their feathers, their wings on top of each other and to be inside each other as much as possible. And what's so cute is to watch them as they began to become young adults. And they test out sitting in a line on a branch. And they try that a little bit, and then they all huddle together again, you know. And like night after night, they try, they sit at, in a line a little longer, and then eventually one night they they sit in line, they, and they don't huddle together anymore because they they become young adults. Well, I could tell you many stories, and um, I will just say this before I give you a chance to ask at least a few questions. Uh, we have a table outside. All the literature on the table is free. I urge you, please, to take the literature that I brought for you. Um, three things that I urge you to take amongst everything else, and I ask, uh, urge you to take one of everything that's out there, is uh, providing a good, a, how, a, a good home for chickens, things to know about what they like to do, as well as building a, a house uh, and how to build predator proofing. I think people who say, well, we just let our chickens, you know, it's not take its, you know, we let nature take its course. If they're going to be eaten by raccoons and, and foxes, well, we're okay with that. That's nature. Well, I want to tell you something. If you're going to keep chickens, you have an obligation to protect them from predators. Uh, you can build wonder and easily, you can build wonderful yards, totally enclosed, where they can run around, they have their perches and everything. Uh, you don't want to just take that attitude. Well, you know, it's just nature, right? Because people are sort of pick and choose what, like, what they want to call natural and whatever's more convenient is natural or not natural or whatever. Um, the second thing is uh, a lot of people who are keeping chickens have the attitude that, well, you know, if they get sick or something, you just let them get sick and die. Don't keep chickens if your attitude is that they don't deserve veterinary care. If you can't afford to keep them properly, don't keep them. If you're not willing, chickens get respiratory infections. And because of all the breeding that's been done to chickens, they're often very susceptible to illnesses that uh, uh, th their ancestors are not susceptible to. And then there are all the different types of climates. But respiratory infections is one of the things that does afflict chickens. In most cases, easily treated um, by Batril or some other uh, appropriate antibiotic. But I mean, you know, we have a, veterinary, uh, a veterinarian. We have three, actually. And we make sure that our birds get the same care that we would want to ha get if we were under somebody's, somebody's care and we, you know, we needed help. So, you know, worming medicine, uh, antibiotics, I mean, they have to be part of, 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 of your arsenal there to when, if you're going to keep these, these birds. It's the same as you would have for a dog or cat. Is, I only have two more minutes? I thought I had ten. What time do I have now?
including questions. Okay, well, I'm going to stop then and, and give you a chance to ask a question. Yes, please speak real loud so everybody okay. can hear you. Um, about the factory farming world, of course, the first thing stop mass producing them, but what is your stance on the enriched cages? Well, what is my stance on the enriched cages? Yes, okay, first of all, I want to tell you this. If you're a reader of Animal People, uh, the uh, magazine, you're going to know that I am going to have an article in the next issue specifically addressing that issue. In our battery hen um, section on our website, we have um, uh, a, 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 a collective statement that, was, that I wrote that a number of uh, farm animal sanctuaries signed on to uh, opposing enriched cages for the reasons that we give that I don't have time to go into right now, but I can talk to you at my table if you like. Um, our st and I think I'll let it go with that for right now. Um, we, we, we supported a ban on cages. Um, chickens do not belong in cages. They're never going to be happy in a so-called enriched cage, and I'll tell you one thing. Well, I won't get into it right now. You know, the word enriched is a euphemism, okay? Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with what chickens are actually going to be experiencing. And the cages are still going to be stacked from the floor to, you know, up high. There, if you've seen pictures of the buildings with the enriched cages, there's still the 500-foot-long buildings, and the chickens are just locked in cages, you know, with this little bit of furniture, and little tiny, what I call thumbelina furniture. Um, I think I have one more, one more question. Yes. Is it legal to pasture raise chickens? What about packages? The labeling, they pasture raise. The label. Pasture. Yeah, what about the label? Is it humane? Well, you saw an example of pasture raised. Uh, 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 I hate to use these terms, broiler chickens, meat-type chickens. But see, there are two separate industries. There's the that developed in the 20th century. The meat-type chicken industry, what they call the broiler industry, those chickens are slaughtered at six weeks old or sometimes five weeks old, like those birds there. But they grow to a huge size in, in, a, in a short amount of time, and they develop a huge amount of breast muscle tissue, which, of course, throws them off balance. They're susceptible to heart attacks, uh, lameness, and everything else. Um, so you saw an example of pasteurized there. Well, anything, huh? Not pasteurized, pasteurized. Yeah, okay, pastured. Raised. So, like, it's, so I've seen some chickens that say that they're pastured, like they're being field-raised. Well, the picture, the, the images you saw here were pasture-raised chickens who were then just being grabbed up to be slaughtered. Um, they also have what they call these movable pastures where they put them in a pasture, which is often, again, um, just, you know, very small, and they're crowded in there, and they move it around from part, place to place on the property. So the question is, is it humane? It's, it's less inhumane than they're being locked up in, by the many, many thousands in a, a completely enclosed building. Yeah, it's less inhumane. And I don't use the term more humane. I use the term less inhumane. So it's less inhumane, yes. Anything that allows the birds or any animals to have more access to expressing a natural interests, activities, and behavior, to that extent, it's going to be better. But being better doesn't mean it's good. Thank you, Karen Davis. Give her a big round of applause.